Dr. Jason Saunders here. Today, we're gonna to go into the cell signaling aspects of hyperbaric oxygen and some of the effects that that has on healing and regeneration and, and the mechanisms behind how that works. Specifically, by going into the chamber and getting excess saturation of oxygen, literally dissolving oxygen beyond the red blood cell carrying capacity. And then when we get out of the chamber, that oxygen doesn't have the pressure to stay in circulation. So as we get out, the oxygen starts leaving circulation, interacting with our cells and triggering certain receptors. And it's through the receptors, you know, it's basically pressure sensors and oxygen sensors of our cells that are triggered when we're inside the chamber. And when, then when we get out of the chamber, that seems to have this massive effect on healing and regeneration. When those receptors are turned on or turned off, it literally changes the expression of our cellular function. It has an effect on our genome and our epigenome. You know, to date, there's over 8,000 epigenetic markers that are uh, affected by hyperbaric oxygen going in and out of the chamber. And so it's an enormous effect on our cells, on our capacity to heal and regenerate, but also on our capacity to improve performance and really bio-optimize, you know, function and physiology. And, and a lot of us are, are looking for that type of effect as well. What I say often when I'm lecturing is your health your level of health, your quality of health, your quality of life is ultimately equal to the quality of the signaling that your cells are able to do. If you can send messages throughout your body and those messages are heard and they're clear and the responses are appropriate, our quality of life tends to be pretty high. And when we start to get breakdown in the communication of the different cells and tissue types within our body, that's when things really start to go wrong. That's where we really see either degeneration of our physical body or our brain, or even overall the degeneration of our quality of life. And so with all communication, there needs to be some sort of stimulus, something that activated. You had to smell something, taste something, feel something, experience, right? Your nervous system has to pick up on some type of stimulus. That stimulus has to be detected. The detected stimulus needs to reach your brain. Your brain needs to understand what that stimulus was. Then it has to start creating a programmed response to that stimulus. And then the actual response has to take place. And those steps are the critical steps, literally for you listening to this video, for you going outside to play, you know, catch with one of your children, for you to go to the gym and work out or go to work. There's trillions and trillions of these signals that are happening all over your body all the time without your knowledge. And the quality of those signals is really going to equal your quality of life. And all the different parts of your cell are responsible for that. Your cell membrane, your nuclear membrane, your mitochondria, your mitochondrial membrane, your ability to package and get rid of waste products inside your cell, your ability to take messages from outside the cell and bring it into your genes and your epigenome so that you can actually have a proper response. All the different parts of your cell are responsible for different aspects of that sequence of events that needs to take place in order for normal function to occur. And ultimately, if we're able to keep our epigenome really healthy, then we're really gonna see an improved type and amount of gene expression. And when we have good healthy gene expression, we have high quality of life. For those that aren't familiar, what's the difference between genetics and epigenetics? You know, genetics is really, it's a branch of science very specifically uh, dedicated to looking at the hardwired genes that we literally pass down from generation to generation when we have offspring. Those are hard coded sequences of proteins that, you know, we get what we get. OK, our genome is really the combination of our parents genetic material combining to make our own genetic material. And there's there's not an enormous amount of input we have or, or ways to manipulate that. Our epigenome is ultimately the expression of those genes. So depending on the environment that those genes are being exposed to or depending on the environment that you're being exposed to would determine what's the expression, the cellular expression. What does it look like? What does it feel like? What's the function of that cell based on the life? that those cells are living or the environment that those cells are living in. And so that's a place where we can have enormous influence. Healthy environments create and help to support healthy cells and unhealthy environments help to detract from and really improve the rate of degeneration that we see. And in so many cases, you know, my personal belief is, you know, we see so many people aging so much faster than we're typically programmed to be. And, and part of the reason is the expression of those genes is just showing you, you know, outwardly 
what we're exposing our body to inside. And so if we can have an effect in that realm, we can change health uh, in, in enormous ways. So the basis for this is really a, a term that's been coined is hormesis. So hormesis is the ability to create some amount of stress inside your body, enough stress to get a response, hopefully a positive response, and not too much of a stressor that it actually detracts from your health or breaks down tissue. So stress is anything, you know, we've we've misused that term. Stress is anything in your body that requires a response. Anything that causes any change inside your body is a stress. Exercise is a stress. Eating is a stress, right? It's something that you do to your body that causes some sort of change. Now, if it's the right amount of exercise, the right type of exercise, the right intensity of exercise for you, then although it's stressful, you know, the next day, day after, as you heal from the exercise, you should be stronger, faster as a result. Same thing with eating. If it's eating good food and you're breaking that food down, it's causing a change inside your body. But if you're eating healthy food, then the result of that stressor should be a positive one and you should grow, heal and recover faster because you're putting good nourishment, good fuel into the system. Likewise, if it's too much exercise, not enough rest, too, too high of an intensity, your breakdown can exceed your capacity to recover. Now that's a negative stressor on your body. Or if the food you're eating is, you know, unhealthy food, as a result, you know, you're not going to improve your healing. You're probably going to increase your inflammation. Not only are there three categories of stressors, physical, what we do to our bodies, exercise being one example. And then there's chemical, what we put in our bodies, food, vitamins, drugs, alcohol, water. And then there's emotional stress, all the things we think about. And that's really what people typically turn to automatically when we use the word stress. But not only are there those three types, they all interact with each other. In other words, you might eat unhealthy food. And as a result of eating that unhealthy food, there's a chemical stressor that's negative for you. And then you get upset with yourself and maybe beat yourself up a little bit about eating that food. And now there's an emotional stressor on top of the chemical stress. And so you see there's a lot of interaction between all of these stressors. All of these stressors create some amount of hormesis. Now, when we're looking at the hormetic curve, really what we're trying to figure out is below the curve, there might not even be enough stimulus to even create change. It's not even worth it. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get above the, the initial line so that we can start to generate the, the idea that we've created some type of stimulus to our body. And typically the more stimulus, the more, the more reaction we're gonna get. And as long as the stimulus and the reaction are favorable for your body, as you heal and recover from those different changes, those different stressors, you get smarter, you get healthier, you get faster, you get stronger, you get more confident, right? These are all the types of changes that we could create. And it gets better and better, but of course you could hit a, you could hit a peak and then all of a sudden the harder you push, the harder you push, it actually has the opposite of effect. And there's a negative association with the activities that you're doing. Exercise is the easiest to understand as you train you know, especially people who are competitive, as we train more and more, we should start to see increases in performance. And all of a sudden, if we're training too hard or we're not recovering as well as we should, our performance starts to decline. And right away, we think, oh, I must not be training hard enough. So we actually try to push it even harder. And of course, it has the opposite effect on our performance. And so the balance of hormesis is to allow for the most amount of change possible while still maintaining positive direction in terms of health. I bring all of this up because hyperbaric oxygen has a direct hormetic effect on our body. As a result of going into the chamber and out of the chamber and into the chamber and out of the chamber, we're setting off all of these uh, pressure sensors and oxygen sensors, and that's all partly built within the epigenome. And so as we're being exposed to this hyperoxygenation back to you know sea level, hyperoxygenation back to you know normal pressures, and we're triggering all of these receptors, we're gonna create a whole cascade of responses in the epigenome, the majority of which are gonna favor, as long as, again, as long as it's the right pressure of oxygen, the right percentage of oxygen, the right frequency of hyperbaric exposures, we're gonna generate positive, healthy epigenetic expression as a result of that exposure of oxygen. And so there's this, you know, this wave of increasing and decreasing of oxygen throughout a number of sessions over the course of weeks and months. And this, this has been termed intermittent hypoxia, hyperoxia. And there's been some great research done specifically out of Israel on this very topic. And ultimately, this hyperoxia, hypoxic paradox of, you know, we actually stimulate very similar pathways as if you were becoming hypoxic without any of the consequences of actually exposing yourself to hypoxia. And so even though we're, we're, we're never becoming hypoxic, 
we're staying hyperoxic back to normal, hyperoxic back to normal, we still seem to stimulate very sim similar pathways. And so there's this exponential increase in stem cells and angiogenesis, the regrowing of capillary beds, these growth factors, which are all typically stimulated through hypoxia, but there's other consequences of hypoxia. And so in this case, what we're doing is we're getting the benefits of hypoxic type stimulation without the consequences of the hypoxia itself. And within that one, one of those papers out of Israel, which talked about the uh, hypoxia, hyperoxia paradox, uh, we go through some of those benefits. So we know that when we go into a hypoxic environment, you get increased HIF-1. It's a, it's, a, it's a chemical messenger inside your body, um, and it's important for adapting to low oxygen environments. When you have a hypoxic event, HIF-1 is stimulated, but throughout hyperbaric sessions, HIF-1 is also stimulated. Also, VEGF is stimulated in hypoxic environments. That's the signal for angiogenesis. VEGF is also stimulated through hyperbaric exposures. Stem cells and growth factors are also stimulated through hypoxia, and they're stimulated through hyperbaric oxygen as well. But here's where some of the differences are. When you're hypoxic for a period of time, although there are certain benefits of that if it's used properly, over time, you're going to get a decrease in sirtuin activity, and you're going to get a decrease in mitochondrial activity. And sirtuins are critical for uh, healthy cell performance, to getting cells out of senescent states, to getting cells to start replicating normally and functioning normally, to protect our DNA and our epigenome. Sirtuins play a huge role in our biology um, in terms of aging and, and or keeping our cells young and healthy. And of course, we know mitochondria is, an, is a, such a critical part of making the energy for your cells for normal or healthy you know, cellular performance. So the difference here is that with chronic hypoxia, you get some benefits, but some of the consequences include a, a lowering of sirtuins and a lowering of mitochondrial performance and ultimately mitogenesis. If you contrast that versus hyperbaric, you still get those same, uh, you know, the HIF-1, the stem cells, the growth factors, the VEGF, all the growth factors that are involved in that, but you also get an increase in sirtuin activity and you get an increase in mitochondrial biogenesis. We talked earlier in another video that from repetitive hyperbaric exposures, you're going to increase the size and density of mitochondria as a result of those exposures. And those are critical for improving our health. And so this is this place where we actually get the benefits of both, the benefits of the extra oxygen exposures, and we get this benefits of hypoxia without actually ever having to make the body hypoxic. Now, there's a very delicate balance with all the cell signaling associated with hyperbaric between reactive oxygen species, HIF-1, and sirtuins. So reactive oxygen species is basically free radicals, and our body makes their own free radicals every time, even right now. When, you're, when your body makes energy, one of the byproducts of that is some free radical development. You could also be exposed to free radicals outside of the, you know, from the outside world, radiation, smoking, alcohol. There's a lot of things in the outside world that cause us increased oxidation. Hyperbaric also increases our oxidation because as it upregulates mitochondrial function, it also happens to upregulate the reactive oxygen species. Now, what appears to be from the research is that when you get exposed, you know, when you get oxidized from the outside influences like smoking and radiation and other things in the outside world, it depletes us of our own antioxidants that are in our body. And so we've all learned over the years that we need to, you know, we need to start taking more and more antioxidant supplements to try to offset the oxidation that we're exposed to in the outside world. Hyperbaric is different. It seems that when you increase free radical production within from mitochondrial um, production of reactive oxygen species as a result of making ATP, instead of it depleting our antioxidant system, it actually seems to upregulate our own antioxidant system. So we get this increase in superoxide dismutase and glutathione as we start to uh, need more to deal with the extra oxygen, uh, reactive oxygen species that are released from cellular respiration. So what's interesting is, you know, reactive oxygen species has been known, you know, for the last 10 years in medicine to be such a, a terrible signaling molecule that destroys proteins and fats and DNA, which it does. However, when it's done internally through hyperbaric, not only are there the benefits of hyperbaric, it also seems to make us much more resilient to oxidation and upregulate our body's own natural defenses against it. And so again, there's a hormetic balance between uh, cr being exposed to hyperbaric, that creating some excess oxidation, and then our body adapting to that oxidation through improving our capacity to mitigate 
those free radicals through our own antioxidant systems. HIF-1, we talked about a little bit in terms of its ability to oxygen sensor in our body. And when it's stimulated, it generates more angiogenesis, the stem cell release, certain growth factor releases. So HIF-1, when it's stimulated, seems to have a, a very strong effect on cellular repair, cellular recovery, tissue regeneration, including capillaries or, or other from stem cells. And that's both mesenchymal stem cells as well as central nervous system stem cells are all stimulated. And HIF-1 seems to be the mechanism that that occurs. And then again, I alluded a little bit to what sirtuins are able to do, but sirtuins play this role of bringing either cellular apoptosis, you know, this cell doesn't work properly anymore, so we're going to kill it, or it's a senescent cell that could be brought back into normal function. And so sirtuins play a role in determining that cell's fate, you know, should, should we kill that cell, bring in a new stem cell, or can we bring that cell back out of retirement, so to speak, and get it to become a normal functioning cell again? If they also play a big role in the genetic and epigenetic expression and protecting our, our, our genes and our epigenome from excess oxidation. It also helps promote uh, proper and healthy, you know, cell replication and, and cell division. So it plays a big role in the cell cycle of life. And when we stimulate these properly, it helps to keep all of those uh, systems in much greater balance. And then there's all this interacting between the reactive oxygen species and the HIF-1 and the sirtuins, and they all seem to interact and play off one another. And there's enormous amounts of benefit when we can stimulate each one of these systems properly. There are plenty of other ways besides hyperbaric oxygen to stimulate these. All the other tools that we would use, the red light therapy, the sauna, the ice baths, you know, temperature fluctuations, there's hormesis there. Red light therapies, there's hormesis there. Uh, PEMF, uh, certain nutritional fasting, definitely, right? Ketosis and fasting. So as we start to combine different modalities, we start to flip on and off these reactive oxygen species switches, these sirtuin switches, these HIF-1 alpha switches. And as a result, we could really start to maximize that hormetic curve, that hormetic balance. And we're able to create a change inside the body, put stress on the body, but a healthy stress that over the next five years, over the next 10 years, yeah, you're five or 10 years older, but you're healthier as time is going on versus what we typically see in the most of the people around us where our health seems to be you know, dissolving over time, that our body seems to be um, literally degrading over time. We should see ourselves get faster, get stronger, get healthier, get more resilient. There's so much room for the average you know, American right now to improve their health. And these are just some of the tools that help it. And this is some of the interaction, the chemical, you know, cell signaling interaction that helps to uh, create the stimulus to help make that happen. So I hope that was interesting. I hope that would help you. And I hope that answers some of the questions with regard to hyper hyperbaric oxygen and what role it plays in some of the cell signaling cascades and the effect that it has on, you know, the healing and regeneration of, of various cell types and tissue types. Okay, uh, see you next time. And thanks again.